Today's Old Testament reading can be found on page 150 and 151 in your pew Bibles. It's from Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 7 and 8. Let's listen for the word of God. If there is among you anyone in need, a member of your community in any of your towns within the land that the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. You should rather open your hand, willingly lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. The New Testament reading is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, found on page 990 and 991. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love not in word or speech, but in truth and action. Here ends the reading, and may God bless these words to our understanding. Good morning, everyone. Friends, won't you bow your heads in a spirit of prayer with me for our time together? God, help my words be a vessel for your truth, love, and wisdom. Help us listen with open hearts for when you're calling us to transformation. And may the time we share today be in service of you. Amen. When Reverend Joe let me know that the first time I'd be preaching at Plymouth would be during our series on the history of congregationalism around the world, I'll admit I was a bit apprehensive. As I'm sure you'll learn throughout our time together, I'm what you could describe as a text-based preacher. By that, I only mean that even within the darkest of texts, I can always mine for a nugget of good and find the hope in the story the author has woven. I can rely on knowing that, whether satisfying or not, after a certain number of pages, the text will reach a conclusion. And with the New Testament, this process often isn't even that hard. It is called the good news for a reason. But for me, people aren't as easy as texts are. The stories of our real difficult lives are rarely wrapped up in a silver bow, and to engage with one another is to encounter both the brokenness and the beauty of humanity and the institutions we create. Congregationalism, the denomination we find ourselves as the inheritors of with the UCC, is no exception to this duality. Our history is both one of beautifully embracing autonomy and difference, and one of upholding and further perpetuating the broken systems we find ourselves within. And this has been true since our origins. When the Congregationalists first gathered in London for an ecumenical meeting between different denominations in 1794 in hopes of forming the London Missionary Society, Congregationalist leaders were presented with a moment to consider how we might live out God's commandment to go and make disciples of all nations. We decided that the following mission statement best represented our aims as we ventured into the African continent. It is our goal then to spread the knowledge of Christ among heathen and other unenlightened nations. Of course, I can't deny the beauty or the richness that comes from a life shared with Christ, but I also can't deny how fraught the underlying assumption is that just because the material culture of Africa looked different from that here in the West, that these far off nations were in some way lacking enlightenment or weren't as culturally valuable in their own right. If we believe that God is and always has been everywhere at all times, then we cannot deny that God has long been whispering in the cool waters of Cape Town and dancing in the apricot trees of the Klein Karoo, even long before the missionaries arrived. There's so much to be learned from embracing native wisdom, and it took the majority of our Congregationalist ancestors 
far too long to figure that out. And so it's our responsibilities as the inheritors of this congregationalist history to learn about and thus reconcile with the centuries of Native folks who were harmed as a result of Western colonial and imperial missionizing efforts like the ones we took part in in Southern Africa. When speaking of the impact of Western missionaries in South Africa, the former Archbishop of Cape Town, Desmond Tutu, is said to have often relied on the following phrase, quote, when the missionaries came to Africa, they had the Bible and we had the land. And they said, let us pray. So we closed our eyes and when we opened them, we had the Bible and they had the land. And he's right. Though Congregationalist missionaries brought some meaningful contributions to the region, especially in regards to education with things like Ananda Seminary, which was one of the first schools for girls in the region, they also often laid claim to land on behalf of the Dutch and later British colonizing powers, and they did little to quell the violent means by which these entirely white settlements were established. As missionaries of the 19th century wrote home to Europe describing their experiences in Southern Africa, you can see the seeds of racial division being sown in their words. John Philip, the superintendent of the London Missionary Society at the time, though an ardent abolitionist, still argued for complete British control over the political and economic systems of South Africa so that, quote, British rule might become a blessing for this ill-fated continent inhabited by the victims of ignorance and depravity. Philip's words are not the first and certainly not the last time that we'll see the language of ignorance and depravity used to describe black indigenous people in South Africa whose expansive cultural and spiritual traditions resisted the confines our congregationalist ancestors sought to impose. In fact, it's as this very rhetoric is repeated throughout South African history and passed down to generations who do not remember a South Africa before the division of blacks and whites that we see the basis of the system of apartheid begin to emerge. However, if there's one thing we Congregationalists have historically held fast to, it's our belief in individual autonomy. Churches by the people, for the people. And in this case, once the gospel initially spread, the people of the church became largely black. And what a blessing that has been. With each generation, more and more indigenous South African Christians began to infuse a local flavor into the Congregationalist churches first established by missionaries and early colonists. We see the Zulu and Bantu Congregationalist churches form and we begin to offer services in Swahili, Setswana, and other native languages of the region so that congregants can begin to hear the good news, not in the language of their oppressor, but in the language they pray their most intimate prayers in. Hymns, like the one we're singing today, bring rhythms into the church that have been echoing in the villages for centuries, and with it, Africans begin to dance in the church in a way that they never had to learn, but that their bodies have always known. Church begins to feel less like a Western import and more like a holy meeting ground of grace and repentance from Christianity and unity and interdependence from traditional African philosophy. As the 1960s roll around, racial divisions both out of and inside of the church reach a crescendo and we see congregationalist denominations of South Africa boldly move towards unity even as they squabble about the particularities of ritual and organizational structure that never ends. In 1967, the church is still operated by the London Missionary Society, joined with the Bantu Congregational Church and the Congregational Union of South Africa to form the United Congregational Church of Southern Africa, or the UCCSA, which remains one of our partners through Global Ministries to this day. When the earliest leaders of the UCCSA were asked why they felt called to form one church spanning five present day countries and three previous denominations with thousands of members, they pointed to the theology of Ubuntu. Ubuntu roughly translates from the Bantu languages into the English as, I am because we are. Though the word Ubuntu has been used for centuries in Southern Africa to describe that our individual humanity is intimately tied with the humanity of our neighbors. 
It was first coined as a distinct theological perspective by Archbishop Tutu, who has asserted that Ubuntu theology was one that took seriously God's call in Deuteronomy 15 to open our hands and willingly give to those in need, especially when those around us most need freedom. An Ubuntu theology is one that can't shake First John's call to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. It's a theology that reminds us that our faith is not an individual pursuit, but a communal one, and that our journey towards God is inseparable from our journey with one another. Ubuntu helps make room for the brokenness and the beauty of the world we operate within and the historical legacies we must confront. If I acknowledge that I am who I am because of who you are and who my siblings in Southern Africa are and who we all are together, that I'm also acknowledging that to see you suffer and to turn away is to miss the blessing that comes with Ubuntu. In turning away from what my neighbor has to offer and what I might have to offer them, I miss the chance to hear God's voice anew as it reverberates between our two bodies in a way that just wouldn't echo the same if I was on my own. Because Ubuntu is rooted in our humanity, it's about recognizing that we're all flawed and capable of harm, and yet we all have the capacity for transformation and redemption. Ubuntu reminds us that, as Archbishop Tutu taught, forgiveness is a powerful force that can liberate both the oppressed and the oppressor, allowing us to move forward with a renewed commitment to collective justice and reconciliation. So as we go forth this week, I want to challenge you not to turn away, but to lean into the perhaps uncomfortable and certainly liberatory blessing of knowing that your humanity is bound up in that of every person you encounter. And you are because we are, and I am because we are. Amen. <laughs>